Welcome to the 15th session of the International IVF Initiative, or I3. I'm honoured and excited to be co-hosting this 15th session with Charlene Aloof. Charlene is relaxing mid-afternoon in suburban Philadelphia. I'm in the northwest of England, um, where the sun will soon be setting. My name is Alison Campbell. I'm the Group Director of Embryology for Care Fertility. It's a cohesive network of clinics in the UK and Ireland, um, where I oversee 11 IVF laboratories which is actually easier than my other job, raising my three teenage daughters. But I'm pleased to introduce you to today's session entitled Decision Making, AI and ART, an examination of whether we could use artificial intelligence to assist us in making important decisions during the lab stages of ART. So I'm joined by Charlene, who is the Deputy uh, Laboratory Director for Chelsea Fertility NYC, the Reproductive Science Center in New Jersey, and South Jersey Fertility Center in the US. And when she's not traveling throughout New York and New Jersey, she could be fly found flying coast to coast in the US as the PGT T con uh, clinical specialist for Invite. So Charlene, um, why do you take over from here? Um, I'm gonna have a nice cup of tea. Thank you, Alison. Uh, tea, isn't it wine in pajama time there for you or soon? Very soon, yeah. <laughs> Good, uh, good evening, good afternoon, good morning to some of you. Our speakers today are providers and product developers in the area of artificial intelligence. They represent the IVF industry in the clinical laboratory. Behind the scenes, we have our wonderful I3 team, including Thomas Elliott, Marianne Svetez, Shaista Sadrun, Jacques Cohen, and Peter Naj. Additionally, our technical team today includes Alex Parker, Liesl Nell Tamat, Giles Parker, Palmer, I'm sorry, Giles, and Dara Berger to assist in answering your questions. For any disclosures in bio speakers and moderators, please refer to our site, www.ivfmeeting.com. Look up the 15th session. Please note that all questions must be asked through the Q&A feature. Please do not use the chat function for questions as our panelists will not be monitoring this area. Submitted questions will be answered either verbally by the speakers or in writing by the panelists today or after the session. Answers will be posted on our website. In addition, please do not use the Q&A nor the chat for any solicitation of products or companies. The session will be recorded and will be available later via a link on our site, as in all past sessions. We are very fortunate to have three outstanding speakers today. They are Dr. Dan Nayat from TRIO and Future Fertility in Toronto, Canada, Daniela Gilboa from AIVF in Tel Aviv, Israel, and Dr. Michelle Perugini from Life Whisper based in Australia. I apologize, I'm having a, a technical difficulty here. Here we go. Shall we do the poll now and then uh, I can introduce the first speaker? Yes, I think we should. We just have a quick poll to assess your technology and capacity for grading embryos. We will review the poll after our speakers. So we just gave a couple of minutes for the poll to be completed. It's just sure. two questions. We won't keep scrolling, it's only two questions. Okay. And then you can minimize it out of your space to, to see the lectures. So now I'll, I'll hand this back over to Allison to introduce the first speaker. Thank you very much. So it is my pleasure to introduce the first speaker, Dr. Dan Nayot from TRIO and Future Fertility in Toronto. Dan is a staff physician at TRIO Fertility. He trained at the University of Toronto and at McGill University before continuing his academic pursuits at Harvard University, uh, a lot of top universities. So Dr. Nayot is an active publisher and reviewer for several esteemed fertility journals and continues to be involved in clinical research. His academic pursuits have evolved into the entrepreneurial domain, co-founding several fertility-focused startups and actively working as an expert consultant. 
He's the co-founder and medical director of Future Fertility, applying artificial intelligence to reproductive medicine through image analysis of oocytes, embryos, and the endometrium. Today, Dan will speak on using artificial intelligence to assess egg quality, innovative technology, and clinical applications. Over to you, Dan. Okay, nice to meet everyone virtually. Thanks for the really nice introduction, Alison, and I'm really honored to be part of this panel. Uh, I think you'll hear three speakers today, myself, Michelle, and Daniela. We're all real big believers in how artificial intelligence can help us. And I think we're all gonna focus in the IVF lab today. Uh, the first presentation is myself, and I'll be focusing on the eggs. Uh, I only have 15 minutes, so I'll try to do my best. Uh, my understanding is most of the audience, but probably not everybody, is an embryologist, so I'm going to skip through the basic stuff that you know better than myself uh, and sort of hit more of the clinical applications, the technology, and where the future is going to be. Um, okay, so I am a REI, I'm a, I'm a fertility physician, and this started as a research project for me and turned into an obsession, uh, usually, and so that's what led to the founding of Future Fertility. Uh, usually we use artificial intelligence, at least in healthcare, to make things faster, more accurate, uh, cheaper. Uh, we, what you'll see today, what I'm gonna present is we actually use artificial intelligence to solve a clinical problem that I couldn't figure out another way to solve. So it was a means to an end for me. So let's, let's go right into that. Okay, so just in terms of visual classification, so I mean, things we see with our eyes, we honestly in fertility, we try to measure everything we can and that's important. We use that to give patients feedback, to make predictions, to do quality control and research. Um, one of the first things that I learned during my fertility fellowship is how many things we can measure visually. So sperm, of course, that's advancing every few years with the WHO, uh, embryos, which, whether it's cleavage stage or blastocyst, and even the uterus uh, in terms of endometrial thickness and lining, but I just, I couldn't believe when at the moment when I learned that there was no egg scoring system and I go through the same sort of shocking thing several times a day when I tell patients there is no real way to score your eggs. Uh, so this is the clinical problem for me. I mean, I think everybody would agree some sort of egg scoring system would have lots of use. I mean, for eggs, if we have severe teratospermia, we may be able to recommend ICSI. If we've got two poor quality embryos, we may recommend to put both in at once just in terms of efficiency. If our lining in, on the ultrasound looks too thin, we may cancel the, the transfer. So just having those clinical decision-making tools is extremely important. So um, I thought AI would solve the egg quality assessment problem that I see every day. Okay. So we always use the term uh, oocyte quality, but we don't really know what that means. I would say that most of us would agree it's a loosely defined term to say the potential of an egg to result in a baby. Of course, there's a lot more than just an egg that comes into that, but that's sort of the general rule. Um, I mean, you can think of egg quality as binary. This will lead to a baby or this will not lead to a baby. A lot of people view it as sort of as efficiency. So somebody who requires four eggs to lead to a live birth would be deemed to have high quality eggs, whereas someone who needs four IVF cycles and 60 eggs would be deemed to have low quality eggs. But really it's a loosely defined term. And again, there is no uh, visual, so non-invasive way to score those eggs. Okay. Um, so again, the embryologists on the other side of this computer uh, don't need me to tell them about this, but just to tell you from the patient's perspective, when they hear about an egg, they assume it's just circles. Uh, for us physicians, we are a little bit, not much more uh, advanced than that. And we talk about nuclear maturity, is it mature or is it immature? But as embryologists, there's obviously lots of information, whether it's the cumulus oocyte complex, the nuclear maturity, the cytoplasmic maturity. So there has been dozens, several dozen uh, dysmorphisms or morphological features that have been identified. Um, the problem is nobody has been able to put these all together to create a scoring system. So there isn't a, a checklist box that says, you know, if you've got vacuoles, it's minus one. And if you've got uh, symmetric ogres, it's plus three and give you a nice score. In fact, for every uh, paper, you'll see that um, a certain dysmorphism is a negative prognostic factor. There'll be another paper that shows it has no actual impact. Uh, probably the most obvious case of that is, uh, I mean, this is a whole other topic, but the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Uh, I've recently been a, a reviewer and saw a paper that, you know, sort of, 
it's, it's this pendulum swing in the other way saying uh, these eggs don't sort of correlate to blastocyst ploidy and why are we discarding them but just overall I think Alpha came out with a consensus 2011 that there is no scoring system so me myself I thought this has to be solved okay so why would an egg scoring system be useful? Uh, here I'll present two ideas, but since then a third one has come up for us. So the first obvious one is uh, prediction of oocytes. So social egg freezing would be the most obvious one. So as physicians, again, so egg freezing is an exponentially growing uh, technique, mostly in the social egg freezing, but also we, need, we use this for egg donation. We use this for medical necessary egg freezing. Uh, as the clinician speaking to the patient, um, we actually get very, very basic feedback. We sort of say, hey, your age defines your egg quality. That's your chance per egg. And your ovarian reserve defines your egg quantity. So we'll multiply it together and we go to a historical chart and say, you know, you're 36 years old and you, you got 10 eggs. So we think you've got a 50% chance that this will lead to a baby. In reality, may, there may be two babies in that cohort. You, you might not even be close. You have no idea until you use those eggs. And of course, that's better than nothing. So I use this every single day. But you, I think we can all agree that not every 36-year-old is exactly the same. I mean, you know, BMI, comorbidity, smoking history will all make a big impact. But uh, patients every day say, you know, you took out my eggs, you looked at it. You know, am I better than the average 36-year-old? And I say, unfortunately, I, I don't really have that kind of feedback, but I wish I did. Um, so that would be the egg prediction, what will happen to these eggs. The, the second part would be egg assessment. I think this one is a little bit more, less obvious. So of course, I would say around the world where there are parts of the world where we have to only use certain amount of eggs. Let's, let's say only fertilize three eggs at a time. Um, but most, um, most IVF labs will use every mature egg that they have. Why not? The more eggs, the better the opportunity, I would say. Um, but in reality, we have no feedback. So I can tell you from a physician perspective, if the cycle works, nobody has any questions and we all celebrate and we talk about what a great protocol I came up with. Uh, but when it fails, which is unfortunately still the majority of the time, everybody wants feedback. So we go through what your uterus and lining look like, what did the embryo grading look like? What, if you did PGTA, we can add that information. What did the sperm look like on the day of? And we really don't have feedback on the eggs. We sort of do logical deduction. Uh, embryos didn't look so great. Sperm looked great. Therefore, it's your eggs. What did you expect? You're 41 years old. Let's try this again. Um, so I think it'd be extremely informative because as embryologists on the other side, you know that there's eggs that you've seen that can somebody please relay the message to the patient that it's time to move on to egg donation or maybe, you know, change the protocol or something like that. So sort of our theory here is if there was an egg scoring system, it would be used for every single part in every single cycle. The, the third uh, application we, we noticed would be quite helpful is in the uh, egg donation world, especially nowadays that there are guaranteed programs. So of course, you know, if you've got 18 eggs for one donor and you'd like to split that into three different recipients, you would love a possibility to get one live birth in per each six eggs, but sometimes we see two, two babies, zero and zero. So if you can use a way to sort of stratify your egg selection or even the number of eggs you need to reach a certain uh, clinical outcome, I think that'd be quite benefit. But really these all zone back to, is there a way to assess an egg? Okay, so this is the solution uh, we're working on. Uh, we called it uh, the Violet. The Violet is a non-invasive 2D image analysis AI application. That's a lot of uh, descriptive words there. Um, and this came about with a few teams. We obviously have AI experts and we have clinicians like myself giving feedback and patients telling us we don't understand this report and you got to change it around. And embryologists, you know, one of the key feedbacks we got is it doesn't matter how good or not good your machine's going to be. If it's gonna take us 17 minutes per egg and we have 200 eggs to work on today, no one's ever going to use this thing. You need, one of the key things we learned very quickly is you need to not disrupt the work lab. So we decided to do this as a, uh, a light microscope automated system. So the reason we use light microscope is 
because I mean the eggs are stagnant. You don't need a time lapse uh, image of the egg. Nothing's going to happen to it. Um, we want everybody to be able to access it. Anybody with a Wi-Fi. So a light microscope is by definition in every single lab out there. Uh, and we created an automatic system. So obviously track it, you know, it can identify the egg, it can crop the egg, it can upload it and it, it will show you the results. So let me show you a little bit of what it looks like. Hopefully you guys can see my arrow as I move along. But here's a picture of a standard light, light microscope. So this is a hybrid of a hardware software. So essentially it's just a USB uh, attachment camera uh, to the light microscope. So the software program can see exactly what the embryologist is seeing. And, and they just sort of had to put in the patient's uh, details like ID number and the rest is sort of automated. You just press capture image and it will automatically crop the image, analyzes and print it out. So the ultimate goal, let's, we'll, we'll start with egg prediction. So the, the egg freezing world. So the ultimate goal would be to, hey, what's the likelihood of this egg to reach a certain reproductive outcome, which we'll go into details in a second. But as a general rule, we think, or we know that AI can do anything that a human can do. So if a human can consistently say, there's an SER, there's an SER, there's an SER, so you can train a machine. So we can automatically uh, label dysmorphism, which is kind of counter to what I said, since dysmorphisms don't really tell us the outcomes, but you can imagine how much more research we can do if this was all automated and uh, well labeled. So here is sort of a, uh, sort of a printout report a patient would, go, would, would see. And again, this is in the egg freezing patient. So this is a, you know, a Mary Doe who got 10 mature eggs. So that's objective. There's nothing to talk about that. Although she will get um, uh, pictures of her eggs. Of course, that's not like a scientific breakthrough. There's just pictures. But I, I think one thing you'll keep hearing from patients, transparency is incre increasingly important to them. And just having to hold on to something other than the bill for social egg freezing is important. Um, so the next part is out of these 10 mature eggs, how many blastocysts do you think we're going to get? So this is based on the Violet AI prediction tool. So in this example, we think 10 eggs, there's a 54% chance of reaching four to five blastocysts. Uh, and then we did statistical modeling to take us from blastocyst to live birth. So let's dig a little bit more into like the technology and the validation. Okay, whenever you see, I guess, any research project, but of course, uh, AI, there's a few key things you have to understand. One is the type of data. So there is unbalanced data and there is balanced data. So unbalanced means sort of like real life, this is what happens. So if I had a machine that said uh, yes to fertilization, no to blastocysts every single time, I'd probably do better than a flip of a coin, but it wouldn't be a very smart machine because I'm not really, it doesn't really matter what I'm looking at. So those are sort of unbalanced where you bias it to real life outcomes. Balanced is when you sort of present it with a 50-50 a almost to see how accurate it can pick up good and bad. Uh, also, whenever you're looking at AI outcomes, you wanna, well, you wanna, you really wanna figure out what is the control group? What are you measuring? Is this the standard of care? Is it versus a human? Is it versus other AI machines and so forth? Okay, so uh, any AI machine out there, the first thing they'll do is, you know, there's a few principles. One, you need a large data set. The larger the data set, the better. Second, you need a clean data set. So clean data set means, so you, you, you want a really good picture of the egg and you wanna know exactly what happened to the egg. We started our project trying to go from egg to blastocyst. Um, I can appreciate that's not egg to live birth, which is the gold standard, but we thought we would start from egg to blastocyst for many reasons. One, we would have more data. Two, the lab is much more controlled. Once you put that embryo into a patient, you know, it could be your junior student putting the transfer in. There's a lot of variables outside the lab that, you know, embryologists can back me on that. That isn't our fault. Um, so we, we started to try to do a very controlled system. Also, the outcomes are very binary. So an egg either fertilized or not, it's either a blastocyst or not. So it makes for a very beautiful machine learning uh, project. Um, and we think a blastocyst is a very reasonable surrogate marker for um, outcomes. Okay, so whenever you have an AI project, you usually probably use about 90% of your data set to train the machine and create these algorithms. You use 5% to optimize it and then you use 5% is a blinded study, how good is your, like almost like st stimulation or uh, simulation uh, protocols. 
So with a single image of an egg, we're able to reach about 91% accuracy, whether this egg will fertilize or not, and about 63% uh, whether it will become a blastocyst. And these are, sorry, day five or day six blastocysts. These are not PGTA euploids. That's probably the next thing we're gonna focus on, but again, the data set is going to drop. Um, one really interesting finding we found was the, um, was the, um, the machine, kind of like what embryologist feedback has been telling us, is much better at picking up bad eggs versus good eggs. Ideally, we can do both, but already that's quite useful for us. What are for sure bad eggs? And again, in terms of feedback for patients. What, one very important thing is we're doing this is what we call pure AI. So this is image-based. We are not telling the machine, you see that SCR over there, that's bad. Because in fact, we don't even know if it's bad. Um, we're not telling it, you know, she's a smoker, give her minus two points and things like that. So we're starting with uh, a proof of principle, um, pure image analysis. And then of course, it's just about improving your accuracy from there. Okay, so everybody was excited by sort of our preliminary results. And then the second question everybody asks is, and how does that compare to the embryologist? Because if that's worse, then we don't really need to use our machine. Uh, every embryologist I've spoken to thus far would say to me, well, we don't predict the outcomes of eggs. That's not our job. And I mean, look, there is no egg scoring system. So that's just not what we do. And I said, yes, but I'm one day going to present this research. I have to show the lack of ability for the human eye to predict the outcome. So we took 17 senior embryologists around the world. These are independent embryologists. We showed them 300 eggs and we said, what, do you think this egg will fertilize or do you think this egg will be a, a blastocyst? Again, this was balanced. So tricking the machine and tricking the embryologist. Um, and the one thing we'll notice is the average score for an embryologist is about 52%, which is like flipping the coin which is what they said to us at the beginning. We don't know which eggs will turn into a blastocyst. The other interesting part is we, we made them sort of rank their confidence and the level of confidence and their accuracy didn't correlate. Um, and the other thing is it took them about two hours to um, sort of go through this exercise. So it is a bit time consuming, uh, mentally exhausting exercise. The most important part of the slide is what the Violet, our AI machine was able to do. We, we were able to reach about 63% accuracy from egg to blastocyst, which represents a 20% increase of over an embryologist. Of course, I'm excited that I can tell you those exciting things, but really it goes a full circle. And what we were trying to do, we were trying to solve a problem that the human eye can't. So the human eye can see dysmorphism, a machine can see pixels and patterns and the machine cannot. So this was the first example that, hey, an AI machine could have some accuracy towards a blastocyst and therefore it can rank eggs and therefore it can score eggs. Uh, we did a subset uh, analysis three months later of seven of those embryologists, same 300 eggs, and it said, go ahead and predict it. And of course the machine got the exact same results because it's a machine. And the embryologists, again, about 53% accuracy and 20% of the time didn't really agree even with their own predictions three months before, which is fine, we're all humans. Um, so that's what the exciting part about uh, eggs. As I mentioned before, uh, the next steps are to increase accuracy. So that's going to come obviously with more data. That's going to come with better AI uh, tools that we're implementing at the moment. And then we're going to add clinical uh, variables to its age, sperm quantity, and, and things like that. At the moment, we're doing a prospective validation study at TRIO. So in real time, we're looking at eggs, we're predicting what's going to happen, and then we're comparing the true outcomes. Um, I will leave the other applications of AI to the other presenters. Michelle and Danielle will tell you some really amazing stuff they're working on the embryos. Uh, but if we had more time, I would go back to uh, the endometrium. Um, again, I started with the egg because there was no egg scoring system. Next, next on my to-do list is the endometrium because at least we have thickness. That represents one variable. I think we can do better than one variable, but uh, that's on the to-do list. Maybe I'll stop right there. Um, and give our panelists a chance to field some questions. Great, thank you, Dan. That was really fascinating, beautiful slides. Um, and it, it, it's true, the egg seems to have been overlooked, really. Um, and I'm really glad you're focusing on it. So while they line up the next speaker, because we'll do the full Q and A at the end, um, can I just quickly ask you about the outcome measure and really whether you think there are limitations associated with, with using blastulation? 
And really it's because we know that blast assessment can be quite subjective. Um, and it seems that your analyses must have relied on the embryologist's decision as to whether it's a usable blastocyst or not. And the more work we do with PGTA, I think we're learning that sometimes really poor blastocysts can be euploid and can result in a healthy life birth. So I wonder if you've considered this, um, particularly if the tool was going to be used in different settings with different assessment criteria. Yeah, it, it's, it's a great question. I, I mean, I, I'm not going to be out here preaching that blastocyst is the gold standard, but we think it's a clinically useful surrogate. But one important point, so we only, we require the embryologist to label. So labeling is an extremely important part. Um, and we only considered something a blastocyst if one day it was transferred or frozen, which means the embryologist or the physician thought one day we have the plans of transferring this embryo. So anything that, for example, is like a cavitating morial on day five and arrest on day six to us was considered a non-blastocyst. Okay, great, that's helpful, thank you. So we'll move on. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce the next speak speaker, Dr. Michelle Perugini. Michelle is an academic and entrepreneur with extensive experience in health and medical research and advanced AI technologies. She has a PhD in medicine and she spent over a decade as a stem cell biologist specializing in predictive genetics and translational medicine. And in 2007, Dr. Perugini co-founded a global tech company, ISD Analytics, using AI to predict human behavior of whole populations to assist with strategic and social policy planning. Dr. Perugini is now the co-founder and CEO of Presagen, an AI company. Their first product is Life Whisperer, a web-based application that uses AI to assist with selection during the IVF process, which is commercially available. Today's presentation is entitled AI Technology to Improve Embryo Selection Using Still Images. Over to you, Dr. Perugini. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me today and good morning, afternoon or evening to everyone on the call. I think, um, as you know, that was a great presentation by Dan, and I'm really excited about this session because I think there's a lot of advances that are being made around artificial intelligence in the ART process as a whole. And I think this is something that's emerging trend within the fertility sector, and we'll be hearing a lot more about it. So we're kind of just at the very exciting beginning stages of seeing the real benefits of this technology. I want to start by talking about um, the relationship between kind of clinicians, technology and patient. I think Dan made a really good point that the technology actually does different things to what we do as humans. It has different capability to what we do as humans. But what we know is that clinicians are the primary caregivers. They're the ones making critical decisions that are ultimately in the fertility sector going to impact whether a patient goes home with a baby. And those decisions need to be made with the best available information. And technology is just one of those layers of information that can be provided to clinicians to make the best possible decisions on behalf of their patients. And I think for patients is twofold. Obviously, they want the best possible outcome from their IVF process, for example. But what they also want is treatment transparency. And I think one of the things that's not really talked about with AI technology that much is the transparency that it can provide to patients, giving them some objective measure and some expectation around the likelihood of a successful outcome or not. And I think that's really important for patients. So in terms of the AI and the ART process, it is already here. As you've heard Dan speak to, it's already being used for OSI assessment. We have a product using AI for static day five embryo assessment, which is focused on the morphology and basically predictive of implantation potential. But there's a whole host of other ways that I see AI really impacting this process more broadly. For semen analysis, oocyte assessment, genetic screening, um, analyzing the large amounts of you know, whole genome sequencing data, uh, we're working on some applications in non-invasive PGTA or non-invasive genetic assessment of embryos, looking at um, even drug stimulation protocols and basically optimising those using AI algorithms. 
So there's a whole host of ways that AI is really going to impact the industry. And my view is that it's going to be the collective value of these different technologies that's really going to empower better patient outcomes. So I'm going to focus on embryo assessment during my talk because that's been a key area of focus of our work. And we all know that selecting a high quality embryo is critical to the success of an IVF outcome. And how this is currently done is using either manual visual assessment, so morphology assessment, looking down a microscope. We've all got grading systems that we use that do that. Um, but also we can use morphokinetic analysis using time-lapse systems, which look at the developmental milestones of an embryo in culture. And there's some challenges with these methods as there are with all methods. Um, so the standard morphology grading is somewhat subjective. It's very variable depending on the embryologist, depending on the lab culture methods and expertise. And the morphokinetic analysis is really just one piece of the picture. It's looking at developmental milestones, but it's not really predictive of implantation potential. And it also requires quite expensive equipment, um, which is cost prohibitive for many laboratory environments. Secondly, we can look at genetic analysis of the embryos. And although we can identify whether there's an aneuploidy, it's actually the genetic health of an embryo is very different to the implantation potential of that embryo. So I see these techniques as basically coming together and quite complementary and all required in order to be able to make the best possible assessment of which embryo is most likely to lead to a healthy pregnancy outcome. So what we've focused on is really identifying a very practical way that we can low cost approach that we can analyze static images of day five blastocysts that have been obtained from standard light microscopes in the same way that Dan was talking about that are already in every IVF laboratory around the world and putting in place a web-based system that allows instantaneous analysis using AI to assist in ranking those embryos so that the embryologist has a better sense of the quality of each embryo within a patient cohort and can use that to inform their decision about which to transfer first or freeze or to send for genetic screening. And so how we do this is actually using a combination of computer vision and deep learning algorithms. And what the computer vision algorithms do is allow us to localise, normalise, annotate and segment embryo images when they're dragged or dropped onto our system. And it does all of this automatically because of course, if you need to manually annotate images on a time-lapse system, for example, then you still have subjectivity around those annotation processes. And it can be quite time consuming as well. So again, we're trying to save time. We're trying to get the computer to do as much as it possibly can so that we can get consistency across the analysis of those embryos. And then we use deep learning approaches that basically analyze very complex patterns of features that are not visible to the naked eye. These are very complex patterns, as Dan mentioned, of pixels and different areas of, of color and depth and grayness in the images that can be related to a particular outcome that you train the AI algorithm to understand. So how does it work? I thought it was worthwhile just stepping through process of AI model development, just for those who may not be quite as familiar. The process of AI development really starts with collecting a large clinically and demographically diverse data set of embryo images. This cannot work. You cannot create a generalizable clinical, clinically useful AI if you do not have a clinically diverse data set. And that needs to come from multiple clinical environments different countries with different patient demographics, and you need really clean data around the outcome that you're trying to train for. So in the case of our model development, we trained only on day five blastocyst images, where we knew that there was pregnancy outcome, known pregnancy outcome, we knew what that outcome was. The next stage is the AI training stage. And this requires a range of, as I mentioned, computer vision techniques to segment and look at very specific parts of the embryo as well as deep learning approaches that look at just brute force analysis of complex patterns within each of those embryo images as they relate to the pregnancy outcome. And essentially what it's doing is classifying those embryos into buckets that relate to how, um, how the positive um, implantation 
happens or whether a negative implantation happens. And it gets very good at understanding what a good or a poor embryo looks like and everything in between with a range of confidence levels. We then bring those AI models and computer vision models together in what we call an ensemble and we test it. We validate it on a separate data set that hasn't been used to train. And we use that data set in order to select the ultimate model that we're going to use. And then as Dan alluded to, the important part of this testing process is complete blind testing, which is really critical. And that needs to be done on data that was never used in the training of the AI model itself. So it can be completely independently tested. And in fact, we also have a second blind testing part of our protocol, which is what we call double blind testing, which assesses the clinical generalizability to different clinical environments and those double blind test sets are data that has never been used to train the model but also data from clinics that have never contributed data to the model at all so completely independent clinical environments and we think that that's a really part important part of the testing protocol so we've published this approach so you can see all the detailed data um, in our recent publication, Human Reproduction. But essentially what we've shown is that we've utilised a very large global data set. We've built an AI algorithm that's been blind tested on around 1,600 independent IVF um, embryo cases where we knew what the outcome was. And we have done a range of assessments, both looking at the sensitivity of those models, as well as comparisons directly back to the embryologist standard morphology assessment. And what we've shown is that there's a 25% accuracy improvement compared to the standard morphological assessment alone. And what one of the interesting findings was, I often get asked whether there was a high concordance in the assessment or the outcomes that were predicted by the AI versus the embryologist. And in fact, we do see a very high concordance among those, um, among those predictions, but where they're not concordant, the AI is actually correct around 2.2 fold more often. So the AI gets those edge cases um, correct far greater um, than the embryologist morphological assessment alone. So this is the basis of our current AI algorithm. And one of the other things to note here is that these algorithms are constantly improving. So every six to 12 months, there's a new iteration based on a larger data set of, of data collected in use of the actual product. And so one of the really lovely things about AI is that it can improve over time, it gets better. Um, but what we're seeing is that it is significantly better than what we're currently doing with morphological assessment. So it's providing real value in the clinical environment. So how does the AI then, this is all very complex, the AI build process, but what I really wanted to highlight here is that in that clinical or in the IVF laboratory environment, it's actually incredibly simple to use these tools. And I think that's one of the beauties of, of something like AI in this environment. You can simply drag and drop embryo images directly onto the system um, from a web browser. It's all safe and secure, ISO compliant, HIPAA compliant, GDPR regulated. There's no data leakage, data never leaves the region of interest. Those embryo images get drag and dropped. All of the augmentations, segmentations, annotations, everything happens in the background in seconds. And then essentially what you see is a score out of 10 that relates to the quality of that embryo from the AI assessment. And you can simply use that to rank order the embryos for a given patient cohort. It stores all of that information in a database that can then be accessed later. You can compare different cycles. You can use the reports to give to your patients to provide transparency, or you can use them to support um, you know, submissions to the um, compliance authorities, for example. So it's really exciting technology and, and it's really simple to implement. One of the other really interesting areas that we're working on now, actually, and this was an ASRM abstract published last year at ASRM. It's really interesting. What we're finding is that there are physical proxies in the embryos that we can actually detect using artificial intelligence 
that relate to particular chromosomal aneuploidies. And what we found in this pilot study is that we could predict with quite a high level of accuracy, it was around 82% accuracy, we could actually detect just from image analysis and AI on those static day five images, we could detect images that had a chromosome 21 or 16 change. So this is completely non-invasive assessment of aneuploidies. Now, I'm not at all suggesting that that is going to be as effective or accurate as doing a PGTA assessment, for example, but in many parts of the world, PGTA is not commonly used or is not even available. And a technology like this can really plug that gap and fill a need for those um, patients who, and for those IVF labs that can't currently provide any information around the genetic integrity of the embryo. And as I mentioned before, I think the combination of these different approaches, looking at both the genetic integrity, but also the viability or implantation potential of embryos are critical um, in the way that they are very complementary and give the full picture of an embryo and its quality and likelihood of creating a successful pregnancy outcome. So that's really exciting. We're now going out for global data collection to expand that study out wider and do the proper validation and testing. And we've got around 20 global clinics contributing to that. So if anyone's interested in contributing, we're very open to more collaborators. So overall, in terms of the benefits of AI for static embryo assessment, I really see the major benefits being the non-invasive component, it's instantaneous assessment, it's objective, it's based on an evidence-based, tested, validated approach, and it does better, it's more accurate than our current rating system, so why wouldn't you use it? It's very low cost, it's practical to implement, it can predict implantation potential at a higher rate, and it provides that transparency to patients. And again, I think one of the little known kind of or little thought about um, benefits of this type of technology is that it's software only. So you can update it. We can push an update in seconds to clinics globally. Whereas if there's an equipment requirement, then often that's quite an expensive process upgrading to the next version. And in terms of the future of AI in IVF, I really think it's going to be about platform delivery of AI across multiple um, decision points within the IVF laboratory that's going to have the biggest impact. I think it's going to be really important for collective and collaborative um, bringing together of different technologies so that there's only one implementation within the IVF lab because can't imagine embryologists are wanting to use six different AI systems within a laboratory. Um, and I think what that's going to do is improve the accuracy and decisioning around some of these critical parts of the IVF process. And then I guess it's, it's the, the onus is on both the AI industry, but also the fertility sector to really um, drive that education piece um, to help drive adoption by clinicians. And that will be through, through education around these types of technologies. Thank you so much. Michelle, thank you. That was absolutely excellent. And I do not have time lapse in my laboratory, so I'm always um, drawn to technology like this. So while we're waiting for our last speaker to get ready, I would pose a question for you as um, I'm assuming you're keeping all the patient demographics in your data sets. So for the patients in which implantation did not occur, yet the time lapse picked those embryos, possibly over what the embryologist may have not selected or may have selected. Was there a common denominator? You know, we still have the uterus, which is still uh, a large part of the, of the picture. Is there a common denominator with that patient set um, in their history? Uh, could you speak to that? It's a really interesting question and probably one that we can't explore fully on this call, but one of the things that we've identified is it's actually it's really challenging predicting implantation potential because there's many factors that impact beyond the embryo that lead to a pregnancy. There can be clinical factors that mean that a perfectly viable embryo does not result in a clinical pregnancy. And we've done a lot of work. In fact, we're just publishing a paper um, soon that 
we'll talk to that, um, being able to actually use AI and a an, an different technique that I didn't have time to talk about today that can identify some of those factors that are impacting beyond the embryo. And importantly, it's not about identifying those factors because we can't really do anything about them, but by being able to identify them, you can remove them from the training of the AI. And the reason that's important is because your AI becomes far more high-performing and specifically looking at the things that are not clinical patient factors. Um, and it's really a true assessment of the embryo. And it can also triage and put a spotlight on um, situations where there might need a, a further clinical assessment um, to be done because there's likelihood of patient factor involvement. So it's really exciting body of work and something that we're um, forging forward in that we think will be really interesting. Excellent, well, thank you. I can see that there are a number of questions waiting for you when we open up all the, the Q&A to all the speakers. Thank you, Michelle. Great. I will this opportunity to introduce Daniela Gilboa, CEO and co-founder of AIVF. Daniela is a seasoned embryologist, biostatistician, entrepreneur, and an IVF researcher. She received her master's in biostatistics and epidemiology from Tel Aviv University and her baccalaureate from Bar Ilan University. Together with two IVF physicians, Drs. Daniel Seidman and Ayal Schiff, Daniela co-founded AIVF, a company involved with developing data and AI-driven comprehensive platform for the IVF treatment process. I'm looking forward to her to hearing her lecture, Understanding Embryology with Non-Invasive Deep Learning and Machine Learning. Okay, hi everyone. I'm really excited um, to be here. And um, uh, I consider myself, I'm an embryologist for many years, and I also, I'm also uh, an AI geek. So uh, what I'll be discussing here is a bit embryology from the technological side. Um, okay, so our challenge is uh, in IVF is really to select the best embryos. But do we know how to do it objectively? So that's the main uh, the main problem and the main, main issue. I suggest we don't, but let's see. Um, all of you, all the, the embryologists here, um, pretty much uh, uh, can relate to, to such a patient with 10, 6, 10, 15 embryos all look alike. And this is the dilemma. Two patients, one with uh, six embryos, one with one embryo. Um, these six embryos were all transferred back to the uterus. That, that was about a decade ago, and both resulted in a single tone. So the problem we, um, we face is uh, subjective morphology evaluation, subjective human analysis. We don't have a score, a global objective score, to actually um, understand and uh, evaluate the em embryos correctly. Each lab does their own thing. Each person, each embryology, um, embryologist um, does his or her um, thing. So, so we're looking for the objective level. Um, time lapse, which I, I, I adore. Um, so we know two things. We know there's a good rhythm. And we also know there is a bad rhythm. And the good rhythm is a predictor, and a bad rhythm of the, of the embryo is a predictor. And we also know that the good rhythm and the bad rhythm uh, both result in a very, very complicated and complex model or, or an algorithm. This is an algorithm. So is that the answer really to um, uh, annotate for um, uh, hours in the lab and result in such a complicated model, more or less. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a solution, but I guess um, it's not a solution that can be scalable. So we should look for other solutions and solutions that are not based on subjective human analysis or based on any uh, um, human eye, 
rather um, data-driven decisions, objective data-driven decisions. Okay, so what is all this talk about machine learning and deep learning? So what is human learning? Human learning is learned by, by ruling. So if you want to understand what is the difference between a circle and a square, you should tell the computer what is the rule it should look for, what should count corners. So if there's zero corners, it would um, uh, output a circle. If there's four um, uh, corners, it would output a, a, a square. So this is human learning, which is pretty complicated uh, for, for an AI solution. Machine learning is learning by examples. So we just uh, show the computer or the algorithm, we feed the algorithm with a bunch of examples, like this is a circle, this is a square, now learn. It would probably learn by counting um, the, the corners, but we wouldn't know that. That is the main um, difference. Okay, so what is neural network? A neuron is just a fancy word for a fun function. So neural networks are just a bunch of functions um, trying to model um, uh, X and Y, basically, to simplify things. So ba back to embryology, we would want a machine that would look, on, uh, would look at a blastocyst or an embryo and identify the features um, uh, without um, us humans telling it the ruling. Otherwise, it wouldn't be objective like we want to do. It would be subjective. So we would want a machine to understand what is a blastocyst, uh, what is an eight cell embryo, what is an embryo, and, uh, and what makes an embryo implant. So you have all sorts of uh, methods, whether it's a supervised learning or un unsupervised learning. It's, it's, it's much more complex than, than we can think of. And so this is, like, this is what it looks like from a very simplified, high-level um, look. You've got, you fit the, the um, machine with examples. Um, obscene amount of, of data is needed here to make it um, understand which embryo would um, result as in a baby or implantation or what, whatever we really want to check. We could um, switch between um, outcomes. Um, and now um, AI in medicine is practically everywhere. Last two years, this is a review from Nature Medicine and Eric Topper even mentioned IVF here. Uh, embryo selection for IVF is a very good tool that could uh, use um, AI methods. And so back to the IVF lab. The, what, what is the holy grail of, of the industry? Is really replacing a single euploid embryo resulting in a healthy live um, birth. Uh, so this is like uh, a high level um, scheme of what what an AI development or algorithmic R&D development um, like Dan showed and Michelle and myself, this is what we, we all do in our offices or our, our um, AI labs. We feed the, the machine with, with time-lapse videos and um, electronic medical records of the patient. Um, we use uh, domain expertise, data science, computer vision, deep learning, explainable AI, all these really complicated methods to, to come out with an AI model to predict embryo success. This is one of the, the most um, sophisticated, complicated prom problems you have in machine learning um, because there is, there's so many uh, very thin, small, um, delicate features um, that we might know uh, or we might understand there, are, there is an associ association, but we, we never actually quantified it. And so uh, I, I think that the, the secret here is what I call the holy trinity, is uh, huge domain expertise, huge amount of data, and uh, complex um, algorithms to really solve this problem of which embryo could result in a healthy baby. Um, I'll show you a few examples. 
Uh, this was published um, uh, at ASRM uh, last year by our group. And we followed uh, the two pronuclei that they, they, they appear roughly at the same time, they move towards the center, they fade away roughly at the same time. And what we showed is that any deviation from this pattern is strongly predictive of, of success. Um, so the synchrony we were talking about in, in the events of the, of the divisions uh, is, can be seen here uh, in, in, in the, the formation of the PNs. Um, any difference, slight difference in the sizes predicts embryo failure. Um, slight difference in time of fading is a predictor. So all of these very fine features that uh, appear in the first 24 hours are, um, are predictions, are good predictors for, for uh, uh, blastulation and, and, and implantation. And this is really amazing, come to think of it, how much you can learn from the very first 24 hours of the embryo. Um, I'd like to show you um, another example which I find fascinating. This is a uh, developing human embryo growing in the IVF lab, like we are all used to see uh, on time lapse, but this is from the eye of the machine, what we call explainable AI, what the machine sees and, um, uh, in the embryo and the, look and, and the predictions it gives the embryo. I'll show you, um, I'll play just a minute. <clears throat> Okay, so so you've got here the the here sorry you've got here the the formation of the top the pronuclei. You could actually see the heat map um, that it it understands the machine understands the division. It understood the the, the formation of the the PN. It understands where to look at, what to look at, and after 40 hours, it gives a prediction of 57% for implantation, and then it follows the embryo until 120 hours. And the heat map is a good sign of what the machine is looking at and how it defines um, specific features and maybe understand what the ruling the machine is, is learning. The rulings that we humans never gave it, but it understood by, by, by um, all the examples we showed it. So this is the blastulation. And after 120 hours, you could see here in a minute, it results in 77% um, success, implantation. Um, this is a sneak peek for, of, of our um, uh, system that would be in labs very, very, very soon. And I'd like to talk about the future because I think we are very far ahead of really what the future holds and, and would be, I guess, either explainable AI or any imaging um, capabilities uh, for the molecular scale level in real time. So can we fly to the moon and, and can we really predict genetics, gender, uh, any genetic diseases, mother's health by looking and analyzing the, the first five days of the embryos? Um, stay tuned to ESHRA and SRM with mind-blowing presentations by our group and uh, to be continued. So I'd like uh, to thank everyone here and I think it's a good opportunity for me to present and call you, all of you, um, to form a community of embryologists and physicians and, and uh, researchers and um, any AI geeks, computer scientists, um, to form a group that will evolve and explain and form the new era and, uh, of digital, what I call digital embryology. So if you're interested, um, look up uh, LinkedIn, Facebook, um, wherever. Thank you. Excellent. Yofi, Daniela, thank you so much. <laughs> Excellent talk. Great. A good Hebrew. A good Hebrew. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to ask Daniela one question yeah. and then we, we will open up
um, the, the entire uh, cast of speakers today for general questions. Daniela So is Gardner scoring or any sort of scoring outdated? What is the percentage, what is the correlation of what you see as a, um, a high percentage for transfer or high score versus Gardner or a good blast score? So the Gardner score, if we take it into back to computer science, the Gardner score is like ruling based score. Um, and so the, the, the problem with the Asabir and Gardner and all the other other scores that are they are absolute they're not relative so one uh, a one person's one patient embryo that would be uh, that is excellent um, for uh, for this patient would be um, poor for the other patient so um, since Asabir and and Gardner cannot um, answer this question of the relativity then we should look for a score, a general score that would um, be that would be uh, personalized um, to that specific patient. It would take into account everything, and this did, cannot be by any subjective analysis. Did you find it troublesome at the beginning when you had your priority scores that perhaps you would not have picked that embryo? The thing is with, with the, the scores is that it depends on who gives the scores. You know, I would, I'm considered like a, a very strict embryologist. My friend is much more of a less strict, you know, she's like, uh, uh, um, forgot the, the, the terminology. So she's like uh, welcoming all the embryos in the world. So, so a, a score, a, a, you know, a 4AA, I would give something a 4A and she would give, I would give something a 4AB and she would give it a 4A. And, and the thing is, what is really the, the, uh, the difference between a 6A and a 6B? And how do you uh, um, deliver this to the patient? How do you explain to the patient that, you know, that the, the difference between a 6A and a 6B and a 5B and a 5C, it's, it, it, it is all really the same. So it's kind of like, a, a, I would say, a guesstimation. And so since it's not a data-driven and it's not, uh, and it really depends on who scored it, it's not the way you want to do IVF in 2020. You want it to be optimized, very straight, very accurate, very um, uh, efficient, very quick. So it's not for us humans. It's, I think, the, the, the AI systems that, that Michelle showed a wonderful system and Dan showed a wonderful system. There's, all, um, there's a place for all of these uh, great research groups and, and companies um, to really enhance what we embryologists do, really. It's in the end, it would be a decision support tool for the embryologists and the clinicians to do better IVF, really, for us and for the patients. Agreed completely. Well, thank you to Dan, Daniela, and Michelle. And now we're going to open up questions to all three of you. Allison, you want to start with a question from our attendees? Yeah, that's, that's great, thank you. Well, should we start um, chronologically with the egg? We've got a question here from Giles Palmer, presumably to Dan. Um, what is the perfect egg? What do you look for? Uh, so the question is, what is the perfect egg? I, I think there is a, I think there's a myth out there that the perfect egg lacks these dysmorphisms that we talk about. Uh, in reality, again, when we're talking about pure AI, we don't tell the machine this is the gold standard. If we knew that, we wouldn't really need the machine because then we know what a good egg looks like. Um, so one of the big criticisms, I mean, long story short, one of the big criticisms of AI is the black box. Like, we may think this egg looks great, the machine thought it looks terrible. Why? So the, you know, I speak to many different audiences. Uh, the science version of this talk is everyone's excited about like, all right, can you now hone in what part of the egg is 
is a good prognosis versus the negative is it so that we can focus on the polar body or the mitochondrial clusters and things like that so I don't know. I think I'll probably vote with the rest of the world and say a lack of dysmorphism is probably a good egg. Yeah, makes sense. Um, there's a question from Mark Adamovich. He is asking about you know how confident. I think the question is really saying how confident are you in the system, um, such that if it told you this egg is the chances are futile, would you still proceed and inseminate it or freeze it? A good question. I, I think it depends what jurisdiction you're on. So if you are like the majority of the world, why, why wouldn't you use the egg? It gives you the potential. So this is not a deselection tool. Um, it's more of a feedback tool, whether it's, you know, what egg prediction, so you can give the patient more realistic expectation, what kind of eggs are frozen for failed IVF cycles, what the quality of those eggs might be. But no, I, I, I don't, I can't see any machine. Nobody is out here saying 0% or 100%. This is a, there's limitations to what we can do. So practically speaking, I would never discard an egg. Yeah, fair enough. Um, I'm just one more quick last question before I pass back to Charlene. Um, what's the false, this is from Peter Hay, what is the false positive and negative rate in the violet system versus the embryologists in the study? You know, that's a good question that I don't have in front of me, but maybe if we, if we pass it on to Danielle and Michelle, I can quickly get that for you. Yeah, or we can then um, post it later because we can get back to the Q&A and put it on the website. Yeah, that's okay, a good question. To as, as a general rule, like the embryologist, the machine is better at picking up uh, or identifying a bad egg versus a good egg. Yeah. Allison, maybe we should take a brief break and ask Thomas to share the results of our poll that we had at the beginning of the discussions. Well, that's exciting. Yep, let's have a look. Thomas, are you there? Hmm. Oh, here we go. All right, I suppose as we, uh, as we expected, morpho morphology is the, uh, by far the major grading scheme in use. I, you know, I, I have to admit that most of the practices that uh, I have colleagues in the practices, they, they don't have time lapse because the, um, the machine is, is very expensive, you know, for, especially a lot of the patient demographics, financial demographics. So um, many are still using PGTA with visual morphogenetic uh, grading or morphological grading. That's interesting. Thomas, are we able to post a new question again to see if, um, if people who have attended today, if they're, uh, Yes, if they've changed after this presentation, if you think your IVF lab will change. So it'll be interesting to see if we, if we have any changes here. Um, so I have a question for Michelle. What are the ways to increase AI accuracy? There's so many, there's so many to ways to increase AI accuracy. What I would say though, is that there's a lot of kind of misnomer around quantity of data being the key driver of accuracy. And I, I completely disagree with the quantity of data brute force approach. I think what's going to increase AI accuracy is actually better targeting of the algorithms. So combined approaches I talked about segmentation, um, Daniela talked about explainable AI, talking about honing in on different parts of the embryo we already know from scientific research to be important and incorporating that with the more brute force deep learning approaches that look at more generalized features. And I think the other thing is being able to identify where there's poor quality data um, in the way that I mentioned in response to Charlene's question earlier, is really going to, in fact, our studies have already shown it gives a massive uplift in accuracy, just being able to identify where there's other factors that are impacting beyond what would be related to the embryo. And that allows us to focus purely on just embryo AI um, prediction ability. So I think it's about understanding the problem domain, working with the clinicians, understanding how to target those algorithms effectively, 
is going to trump just getting a large data set. Excellent. Uh, we have a question from Rich Rollins on outcome validation. How does your AI on static images compare in predictive ability against existing morphokinetic prediction of outcome? Thank you. Yeah, thanks for that question. We haven't done a direct comparison to the morphokinetics, but what I can say is that morphokinetic um, analysis using AI to date has not really shown an improvement in, implant, in predictive um, ability for implantation potential. So it's not been it's not been tested in that way yet. Um, there are obviously many groups looking at the predictive ability from morphokinetic assessment, but I do see them as very different to the static assessment. If you're looking at time as a basis and morphodynamic milestones as a basis for the AI to predict implantation potential, that's potentially complementary to the static image analysis. But what we've taken is the approach of looking at that endpoint immediately prior to transfer. If you like, our AI doesn't actually care what happened in the first five days of culture. What it cares about is, is this a good quality embryo and how does it compare to other embryos in the cohort? It doesn't matter if it started off culturing slower and improved in, in over those um, period of time and became a beautiful mature blastocyst with features consistent with a high implantation potential embryo. It doesn't care whether it started off growing slower, it just cares is it a good quality embryo at the end point. And so we think that's a better measure for predicting implantation potential. And I believe there's some other research coming out of um, some of the US based research institutes that are directly comparing the morphokinetic AI to the static images and they're seeing the same thing. They're seeing the static image analysis is more predictive of the implantation potential. Thank you. Could I jump in there, Charlotte, Charlene? Could I just jump in? Sure. Uh, yeah, just to say that, um, Michelle, um, I, I don't quite agree with you. I think that we do know, at least there's some publications, and I know from my first-hand experience that um, morphokinetics can be predictive of live birth um, if approached in a, in a very strict um, way. Um, one question though I would be interested to see, is there a randomised control trial um, performed for, with the Life Whisperer? There isn't as yet, but we are planning them. I mean, the product is in use, so we're able to track outcomes already, which is really great. Um, so we're constantly tracking clinical outcomes and randomised control trials are useful, but they're also a very limited um, tool for assessing AI because AI is not assessed in the same way in a very strict exclusion criteria kind of method than traditional um, technologies within the laboratory. So it's actually quite quite difficult to plan an appropriate trial in that way. Um, but we're always looking to, you know, to do prospective analysis of these systems as we go forward as everyone else is. And I do take your point, I didn't mean to imply that there's no predictive ability of the morphokinetics, but I think the way that um, the way that they've been that AI has been built has not necessarily been on ground truth outcome only. And so I think it's a remaining question if your AI has not been built entirely on ground truth outcome data, then I think it's still an open question as to how predictive it will be of implantation potential in practice. Um, whereas our system has been trained only on ground truth outcome data um, of embryos that have been transferred even in the non-viable class. So only embryos that have been transferred and for which a ground truth outcome is known has been used to train the algorithm. So I think there's some nuance in how these systems are both built and tested that really point to how their true accuracy will play out in clinical practice. Great, thank you. Sorry, Charlene. Back That's to you. Okay. Uh, Daniela, for you from Annabella Marconetto. Uh, Daniela, what about collapsed embryos? Could the software manage these? In the end, of course, it's something that you, you should teach it. Um, some of the features or some of the form, forms, it, it catches um, by itself. Some of it should be taught or by, by um, based by, by yeah, base ruling. But of course, the thing is that what uh, we embryologists see as important might not be seen as important 
by an AI system because it will, in the end, detect, since it learns by a ground truth, it detects what the, the actual features or the forms, the, whatever you want to call it, um, are the ones that are, you know, um, that are predictive. So we might think of features that are predictive, but they wouldn't be, in the end, so predictive uh, uh, um, relative to others. So there's a, that's what I said earlier. There's a, the, an entire field is um, developing right in front of our eyes. It's not classical embryology as we knew it. Uh, there's what, what we call a digital embryology, but it's, it's, it's something that is um, uh, forming as we speak. And so I said before, I think it's, it's, a, it's a good place to start with all the companies and research groups and, and really form a community that would speak this language. So just general discussion amongst the three of the speakers, can AA models be universally applied in different labs? Should, that's the objective. Uh, purpose, you know. Um, in the end, it would be. Uh, I think the beginning is is a bit tough because you um, you feed the algorithm with a specific kind of data. You feed it with uh, data from you know uh, from uh, specific uh, hospitals or specific demographies, and then it learns and it will take time. But in the end, it should be a generalized AI system that will be able to predict uh, what is the, the, the implantation. And the thing is that I find most complicated is all of us now teach the algorithm by um, embryos that were transferred, e.g. this is biased. I mean, we were the ones choosing, choosing the embryos to transfer. So we teach the algorithm by on a ground truth that we actually created. So the thing is, will we ever be able to um, develop a system that would look on the embryos that were never transferred and say, you should have transferred these ones instead of what you selected? And, and this is really the most complicated question and, and, and uh, we'll get there in the end, but, but there's a long way ahead of us. Can I make a comment on that? Because I completely agree with Daniela and I think it points to the comments earlier about morphokinetics versus static image assessment. I think all of these technologies, as I mentioned in my talk, are they're, they're collaborative technologies and the power is going to be utilising all of them in concert with each other because they're telling you different things. An endpoint analysis is the closest, nearest point to implantation. So therefore that's useful for that metric. The morphokinetics also gives you information that as Daniela alluded to, you can't possibly get from only training an AI based on ground truth outcomes where you've already pre-selected those embryos for transfer. So they're doing different things. They give you different information. And I don't think it should ever be considered an either or. I think it should be considered that all of these types of approaches are really complementary, as is the OSI assessment. You know, great, you've got a great embryo, but can we actually influence the quality of that embryo through better right. OSI or sperm assessment? And it's just really the collaborative view of the AI across that whole process that is going to be the important one. And I think generalizability, just to your question, um, Charlene, it's definitely possible and we've shown that it's possible. Our system is being utilized in clinics in India, for example, that have never, we've never even taken any data to train any of our AI in those clinical environments, from those clinical environments, or even in fact from that country. And it's very effective and very generalizable across these different clinical environments. But the reason it's generalizable is because we've built it to be so. We've built on the diversity of data. We've targeted the algorithms in a way that make them generalizable. So it all comes down to the build of those algorithms. That's great. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think probably we'll come to the place where we need all of these things, as you say, we need temporal information, clinical information, yeah. morphological information. Um, I was interested in when we're looking at um, two dimensional images, because I'm very much a dynamic embryologist now these days, but if you 
if you rotated that image, do we still get the same response? Same with the eggs. I guess we could ask this to Dan as well. If we look at a different orientation, do we still, how reliable is it? How reproducible is the result? Or have it, we not? It's an amazing question. When we started this project, one of the thought was, should we sort of, should we line up the polar body at 12 at six to sort of, you know, remove one variable? And all the embryologists said like, please don't make us do any extra work and fidget with each egg. So we <laughs> probably were taking a hit with some form of accuracy in order to be more clinically relevant. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's a good question. I mean, in theory, I mean, we're all talking sort of high level, but in theory, if you can get a robust data set, it shouldn't make a difference. But in reality, it probably does, even if you shift it or the lights are dimmer, or if the camera is different, that's just the reality. But again, hopefully you guys are judging us by the fact that we're trying to build the internet and we're sort of at the dial up at the moment which still is a big uh, step forward. Um, and we're looking for the community to embrace us and help us grow this together. I might make it just one comment on the static 2D image um, analysis that we've done. So if you, if you rotate the static 2D image, of course, the algorithm gives the same score as it should. It would be um, scary if it didn't. But if you, um, if you rotate the embryo in culture, the image that you take is looking at a different perspective of that embryo and it will give a different score. But that score is robust within a very small um, range from our testing. So, you know, the score is definitely different, but it is not a big range of difference. And I think to Dan's point is kind of, we're looking at something that's a practical implementation within the IVF laboratory. And what we don't want to do is build a flake or not a flaky algorithm, but an algorithm that's too um, brittle that requires certain orientation of embryos to be um, photographed in certain ways and multiple photographs to be taken for the algorithm to be useful. And so the, again, the whole, um, the secret source is in the diversity of the data and the different kind of orientations that you've already inherently got in that data set that you're training the algorithm. So it's robust to those types of differences. Dan, uh, Giles, has asked if uh, you ever use the technology for selectivity of donor eggs um, or eggs for donation. I mean, if you had a large donor case, if you, if you happen to do fresh donors and you wanted to, to divvy the eggs up based on their potential, not just maturity. So uh, I'll be a little bit humble. I mean, we're, we're learning as we grow. Um, there's a few things we learned along the way. What, one of them is we started from eggs to blastocysts and we had this really nice report and then patients would tell us, what does that mean for me? I can't do this like logistic regression in my head. And we said, okay, I understand you need sort of a live birth printout. So we did a, a combination of AI and statistical modeling. The second thing we learned, you know, we were just so focused on the first clinical solution, which is egg freezing and prediction. And we started talking to the egg donor worlds and they said, this would be ideal for the egg donor world. We're like, oh my God, we didn't even think about that. So yes, uh, that's on our third application. Either we see this as either like a, like, like you sort of mentioned, like a appropriate stratification and sharing, or even with these guaranteed programs, like guess what? You need more than four eggs. You might need 11 eggs for this cohort and things like that. Or, I mean, I, I don't know how the egg donor community is going to embrace it. It might be part of a, you know, you, you, you didn't get a high enough score to be an egg donor or I don't know if it's going to be another screening tool. But the point is, once an egg assessment tool will be available, it'll, it'll be used in every time we look at an egg. And will the algorithm change on fresh versus frozen, you know, vitrified warmed eggs? Is, are you seeing a difference? Yeah, so that's the that's the study I would love to do. If you're talking about getting data from around the world, to get freezing and thawing data is even harder. Uh, our best approach of this is to team up with the egg donor uh, community, but they don't always have pictures of the eggs before they freeze it. So this is going to be like down the line prospective study that we're going to do. Great. Allison, should we bring up that secondary poll? Oh, yes. And I understand that the uh, attendees cannot see the percentages. So okay. could you read out the percentages? 
Yeah. So, okay. So here we have, um, this question was, after this presentation, do you think your IVF lab will change your primary method for embryo grading in the near future? 42% said yes. 23% said no. 30% said I don't know. And 5% it's not applicable. Maybe they don't have uh, the capacity to make such a change, but that's interesting. So 42%, yes, these presentations could make it make a difference. That's really good. It's great. It's great. I see that some of our participants are probably heading off to bed, dinner, or breakfast, depending on where you are. So I guess we uh, we will wrap this up, unless anyone from the panel has any specific questions that they would like to address, or Allison, if you have anything additional. No, I think no. we're good. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, everyone. Well, I, I just, just want to thank everyone who participated. I wanted to thank everyone who participated in the session and discussion. I would particularly like to thank the speakers again, as well as my co-moderator, Wonder Woman, Alison Campbell. I don't know if you are aware, uh, but there is a huge effort that goes into organizing these programs. So I would like to really take this opportunity to thank Dr. Peter Naj, Thomas Elliott, Shaista Sutteran, and Marianne Svetex. Uh, I, being behind the scenes now, I realize just how much effort and work goes into presenting these awesome, awesome meet, virtual meetings. None of these individuals have slowed down during the international break in activity and even during our current times as we begin to open, reopen. Thank you for your dedication and the considerable amount of time you spend on this endeavor. I must mention that one of the more complicated elements, as you can see Alice and I going back between computers, is the triage of the questions that come in through the Q&A prompt. Uh, it's an incredible team back there uh, of preparing the questions so that we can read them off. Uh, and I would like to thank the triage and question team uh, for today's session. Alex, Liesel, Shaista, Marianne, Peter, Giles, Dara, you're amazing. A big shout out to you all. So now I'll hand it off to Allison for some final comments and reminders for this week's session. Thanks, Charlene. It's been a real pleasure. And um, I think our speakers are all doing amazing work. It's been fascinating. So I would just like to, to encourage all of you in the audience to contact I3 if you'd like to help or create some website content through the website. Or if you have any ideas or suggestions about partnerships, we're all ears open to uh, collaborations and participation. Um, so far, over 15 embryology and science organizations have pledged their support to this initiative. Um, Please join us on Friday, same time, same station, for session 16, Optimizing ICSI, Patient Applicability, Maximizing Fertilization Rate, and Reasons and Solutions for Failure. And this one will be hosted by Alison Bartolucci, Amina Alikani, and produced by Dean Moorbeck. So that's it from me. See you all soon, and please stay safe. Peace. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.